thank you, uh, Dean Matthews, uh, uh, Margaret, for organizing this workshop. And it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I would like to talk uh, briefly about the future of agriculture on, on the Big Island and uh, about agroecology. Uh, my main message is that, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. No. My, my main message. Secondly, that we need a plan to move forward with that vision. Uh, I believe the university can be integral, an integral part uh, to help to our, uh, as a catalyst to move this vision forward because they can help to articulate this this vision uh, to policymakers and so on. Uh, the question mark at this point is whether. Uh, the university will align with the vision uh, as defined by the uh, power structure in the state or whether it will align with the vision raised by, by the community. Uh, we can remember <coughs> that in the 1990s, uh, set, uh, 1960s, uh, Senator Paul Fulbright, uh, a former professor and university president, raised the concern of the close alliance of academia with the power structure in, in, the, United, in, in the United States. Maintenance research, and uh, this is kind of the run of the mill research that farmers depend on a day to day basis uh, new tomato varieties, how to work the soil, and so on. And the second one is more of a basic developmental type of research uh, how to understand new methods, how to develop new methods of production. And I want to raise the fact that it's important for us, for the university system, to continue to promote maintenance research. The problem is that for new professors, for faculty, this often, often not, doesn't bring a lot of recognition because you don't get published in the top journals. Uh, but uh, this is important. And my message is that the community can share this information with the industries, can share this information with the university. This is important for us, for the university to be able to recognize faculty. If you do maintenance research, you do varieties, basic economic analysis, you will be recognized. And this is today what is called as community engagement with the community. Uh, so it is very important. There's all kinds of technologies all over the world, a lot of new information, but this has to be tested locally for adaption by the local growers. Uh, if you as a local farmer try to do it on your own, it's, it's just a, like an optical battle if you don't have this type of assistance. Uh, there's been a series of scientific panels over the past 20, 30 years in the United States kind of a retrospective or introspection about the United States system. Uh, this one was called A Time to Change, uh, a summary report on the structure of agriculture. It was critical about the increased concentration of the uh, industrial agriculture on fewer and fewer hands, and it was saying we should do something to, to move this, to change this system. A few more studies came over the past 20 years. Uh, one on the, on the left, publicly funded agricultural research and the changing structure of agriculture. So this report was saying the universities are actually reinforcing this structure towards the concentration of the in, in, in industrial agriculture, as further promoting the industrialization of agriculture. Uh, the one on the bottom of your left, a time to act about small farms with a series of recommendations, how to promote more small-scale farming, 
and alternative agricultural systems. Uh, the one on your right, uh, the concerns about uh, pesticides and how to develop alternative management practices to reduce the impact on the environment and on human health. Uh, further reports like the one in almost 1990 on alternative agriculture, and these reports are saying we have failed to heed the recommendations made in the earlier panels made 10, 20 years ago, and the direction of agriculture continues apace with those same concerns that we had early on about the structure of agriculture in terms of industrialization, concentration of the, uh, of the, of the, of the agriculture uh, on both ends of the spectrum, from the producers to the retailers and the retailers. So new production paradigms have arisen as a result of these concerns about the direction of agriculture. Uh, again, there was a follow-up uh, panel I call, call towards sustainable agriculture. And according to this report, agroecology was the foundation that they used to codify the federal organic standards. Uh, so agroecology or the science of ecological farming was used to codify this is how we're going to develop organic standards uh, on, on the, uh, at the federal level. Uh, so it's called sustainable agriculture or agroecology. And I call it the science of organics, nature farming, integrated pest management, permaculture, biodynamics, and, and so on. Uh, why alternative agriculture? Why are we thinking about alternative methods? Uh, first, uh, as an example, a presidential report on the environment from 2011. Overuse and excess applications of chemicals to soils have disrupted natural processes, habitat loss, air pollution, and chemical pesticides have reduced populations of natural pollinators and natural control agents for agricultural pests. More than one third of our agricultural soils have been lost through erosion and unsustainable practices. Uh, loss of pollinating insects uh, with large costs uh, to agriculture. From the medical front, similar type of assessments uh, from the American Medical Association, uh, which came up with a resolution on a, a sustainable food systems. And they are saying we need to adopt a healthy diet based on pesticide-free whole foods such as veg fruit and vegetable crops. So again, a recommendation to change the way our food system is working, and both from the agricultural and also from the consumption side. Uh, more recently, uh, international panels and the Food and Cultural Organization uh, have indicated that in the near and in the future we can expect continued high food <coughs> prices and price volatility, that this trend will continue. And this uh, analysis indicate that agroecological approaches should be followed by small farmers and are needed to increase productivity and to adapt to the upcoming impacts of climate change. Uh, so this is a growing consensus that we need to develop more ecologically based production systems uh, on, a, on a worldwide basis. So agroecology uh, can be defined as the application of ecological concepts and principles to the design, study, and management of sustainable systems. Uh, basic principles which are based on ecological principles, which is something that you see in nature, uh, for agroecology include diversity, and diversity promotes stability, nutrient and energy cycles, and try to achieve as close as possible what are close, called closed systems. Uh, so there's less leaching of nutrients or other products outside of the system. Intricate food webs uh, to develop complex uh, systems of biological control. Uh, internal biological control mechanisms so that you have to re can rely less on ex external inputs for pest control. So as part of the paradigm change, we're moving away from a linear model. A linear model takes resources from one side and assuming that these are infinite resources that you can always are always available, uh, such as energy and, and chemicals. And on the other side are the outputs. And the assumption from the output side is that there will be left a little impact on the soil or the environment or the health 
uh, from the outputs of these uh, materials. And this contrasts with the uh, agroecological paradigm, which is more of a circular uh, cycle. Uh, again, surrounded and around recycling of nutrients and uh, other resources. And this would be an example of a orchard or, or garden uh, from, from Cuba, following more of a circular pattern or cycle. And it's interesting uh, to see that they do include animal uh, animals as the part of agriculture crop and uh, animal crop production system. Features of the agroecological approach uh, include try to obtain multi multi-functional capabilities out of the resources that you're using. Uh, so if you're using compost or nutrient sources, they may also improve uh, disease management in the field, uh, also the drainage of water and conservation of moisture. Resiliency on the farm to make your farm stronger and less uh, susceptible to, to, to impacts. To increase the social capital in the community. And from agriculture, we know that farmers are the biggest source of innovation in terms of germplasm, new varieties, new seed, new green improvements, but also agri agricultural knowledge. And these ideas are normally taken up by university researchers, adopt these ideas, and actually modify them or fine tune them to adopt them more widely uh, across the industry. And also, a more landscape or regional approach. In Hawaii, we would call it more of a hukua or watershed approach, as compared to our old style of just focusing on what happens on an individual plot or individual farm. Uh, Resilient systems is becoming a buzzword now, especially with climate change. Uh, this basically means uh, that the system can better resist the impacts of climate change. And by the way, we have seen this over the past 10 to 15 years around the world, uh, that the systems can also recover faster from disturbance. Uh, if you have a 10, 15,000 acre farm uh, that becomes disrupted because of flooding or drought, it becomes a lot more difficult for it to bounce back than decentralized and diversified farm systems uh, based on small farms. They just pick up their pieces and come up back in, in, in running, back in function real, real fast after that environmental disturbance. So the agroecological goals would be to improve nutrient cycles, to enhance natural pest control by our control mechanisms to learn from my lineal or indigenous knowledge so you're not starting from zero but you learn from how the culture develop agricultural systems over hundreds of years or multi generations in that area and build that knowledge from that, from that uh, point on uh, and also to empower local communities the local communities become a source of knowledge and innovation rather than we keep being simply recipients of technology. Uh, you, you have to do your A, you have to do B. The information goes the other way around and the researchers simply conduct research to fine tune that local based information. Uh, as an example uh, of the promotion of ecological methods is the increase of organic matter and we can think of organic matter as a water catchment system for the collection of storage of water for long periods of time. Uh, organic matter can absorb up to 90% of its weight in water. 1% uh, organic matter can absorb up to 16,000 gallons of a per acre of food. So we have water conservation and at the same time carbon sequestration by incorporating more and more carbon inputs into the soil. From the energy standpoint, as we learn that energy is becoming more and more expensive and difficult to, to obtain. Uh, the energy efficiency of farms in Cuba is 1 to 15. That means you put one in and you get 15 to 30 back. In contrast, the energy ratio of industrial ag is from negative to one and a half. You put one and you only get one and a half back. Uh, fortunately, there has been almost an exposure in the scientific literature about ecological farming methods. Uh, and we have seen that compared to the early 60s, more and more publications are coming along. And if you open journals nowadays, 
a, a large fraction of those journals deal with agroecological or ecological production methods. Uh, so these are all uh, positive directions. Uh, agroecology, in a way, is an emerging science. It is just getting started. So while it's challenging for new faculty or new professors, it's actually like a totally new world. Uh, and this is pretty exciting. Uh, it is also raises potentials for the state, for emerging states, to become centers of knowledge of all this emerging technology. Uh, some of these fields include systemic induced resistance, and this means that we are learning that in some cases you can trigger plants to develop immune defensive mechanisms in response to attack, to diseases, viruses, insects, and so on. Uh, it's an emerging science at the molecular le level, ecological level. Another area is habitat management. Habitat management is ha how can you design your plantings at the farm level, but also at the larger uh, landscape uh, level. And you're trying to modify the interactions to make it more difficult for new diseases to come in uh, and easier for crops to share resources among themselves in terms of nitrogen, nutrients, and uh, water uh, and, and, and space. And this is something called ecological engineering. Another area is uh, agrobiodiversity or the collection of uh, germplasm for specific communities. Uh, recently in Hawaii, we have been putting together, the Kohala Center has been putting together the uh, public seed initiative. And this basically promotes the development of seed banks at the community level. You develop varieties with plasticity. Uh, just like the Hawaiians did in developing taro varieties, varieties that can adapt to the climate change periodically. As you have more droughts or more floods, you can select and pick varieties that are adapted specifically for that abupua. Uh, this is uh, called agrobiodiversity, again, to promote biodiversity and stability. And I believe that this is another potential for Hawaii to become a global center of seed supplies uh, that you can share uh, with the rest of the world, like in America, Africa, Asia, Asia, and so on. And we did reach that point back in the 50s and 60s. We had a very strong breeding program, and our tomatoes or corn varieties were shared with people all over the world. And I believe that we can return to those days uh, to have make Hawaii a center point uh, for seed production around the world. Uh, the one on your left uh, reads chemical ecology. And this involves the uh, chemical interaction or communication between species on the farm. It could be within the plant itself, uh, one part of the tomato plant with another branch of the tomato plant before hormonal interactions, or the plants with volatiles communicating, communicating with insects above ground or with microbial organisms below the ground. Again, it's a very new science. We're still trying to understand it. Uh, in the old days, we used to make fun of the organic guys that would come up with stories about defense mechanisms and so on. But now science is starting to prove that a lot of these mechanisms were actually uh, enforced. Uh, for example, it may mean uh, that the uh, uh, thrips or mites come and feed on the tomato plant. The, the tomato plant sends a signal, a volatile signal, to beneficial organisms and say, hey, these guys are trying to feed on me. So the beneficial organism knows that they can come in and feed on the aphid or the mites or so on. Uh, again, all kinds of communication going at the different levels. And our question is, how can we manipulate this environment uh, by interplanting tomatoes with beans or with, with squash to try to maximize these positive interactions occurring on the farm? Uh, again, it can occur at the microbial level and at the insect level. And of course, uh, soil quality. Uh, we have studied the soil a lot, but mostly from its chemical perspective and from the biological perspective, it's almost like a new science. In Hawaii, we have almost no knowledge about the microbial activity in the soil in terms of what is there, what's going on. And it's a very emerging science. And again, we're starting to corroborate the old claims made by the, uh, the old time organic farmers that the foundation of a healthy plant is uh, having a healthy soil. <coughs> Uh, just a, a quick example of the complexity or the dynamics that can occur. Here we have a bed in Mozambique. Uh, at the top of the bed you have corn, which can maximize light absorption as a simple plant. On the warm side of the bed, on the northern side, you have tomatoes. 
uh, which need all that heat. On the cooler side of the bed, you have the, the beans, which don't need as much sunlight, but they can contribute nitrogen to the system. Uh, again, the level of complexity, uh, each of these plants has a complex of about 30 to 40 insects. So you can imagine the level of complexity once you start to incorporate biodiversity into the systems. And many countries around the world are starting to articulate how they will move forward to develop these agroecological or organic systems. Uh, this is uh, something that I obtained from a pamphlet of the Royal Organic Project in Thailand. Crop and systems management, emphasis on soil quality, biocontrol, and soil, water, and product quality. Uh, and these were farmers that were actually taking products, head cabbage, exporting them to Europe. So very high quality standards. Uh, but it was like a three hour ride into the mountains of Northern Thailand. A few examples of the organic systems. These are mobile food houses that they can move from side to side uh, as, they, as they move crops to new, new fields. Uh, composting sites on the left hand side uh, to improve soil quality. They actually have a little room with beneficials where they could train their farmers. This is how the lazy wing looks. This is how the, the uh, little flies, the beetles look. So the workers could identify it and say, well, this is a pest. I got to spray it and I'm trying to kill it. Uh, different extracts. And Cuba has done a lot of work in terms of what extracts and beneficial organisms can they apply uh, for biocontrol on their farms. Uh, this is a slide that I used when I applied for a job in Hawaii a long time ago, a few lives ago. This is the, a few programs that were, were around back in the day. Uh, but since that time, things have really uh, multiplied. Uh, today we have several uh, countries that at a national level are developed agroecological models or programs, uh, such as Thailand, Taiwan, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, Bhutan, and also in the European Union. Uh, several analyses have demonstrated that agroecological <coughs> methods are among the most effective in terms of effecting change at the small scale level uh, in tropical locations. The widest study ever conducted on agroecological approaches covered 286 projects in 57 developing countries, representing a total surface of uh, about 40 million hectares or 80 million acres. The average crop yield grain gain was about 80 percent. Uh, concrete examples of agroecological success, success uh, projects abound in Africa. Uh, the College of Agriculture at UH is indeed moving more towards sustainable agriculture and this is a positive development that, that we should all encourage. Uh, about 10 years ago most of the positions were slash biotech and nowadays, most of the positions that you see are slash sustainable. Uh, so this is so, something that industries, uh, the organic farmers associations should come together and say, yeah, this is a great thing and try to promote it. Uh, we have seen a similar trend nationwide. And the question mark is whether this trend towards sustainability is more of a, a, a little a window screen, uh, uh, just as an effort to make it like you're doing that, or is a real change from an institutional perspective. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Dr. Kut Konghui Wan. She has worked locally here with some of the nature farmers with, with nematology and cover crops. Uh, Mark Nikon here in Hilo with sustainable uh, tropical crops. Uh, Ted Radovich with organics and sustainable agriculture. A couple of examples uh, with compost teas uh, with uh, Professor Radovich and also with uh, uh, Professor Aaron Kohn here at UH Hilo. Uh, trying to promote microbial activity and amendments to improve crop growth. Uh, Professor Wan, again working with strip crops, how to modify the environment to, to decrease the level of nematodes and to promote beneficial nematode populations. More basic type of work to try to understand what's going on at the farm level, especially after the plantations close down, how to re regenerate that soil, uh, so, so work with earthworm populations. Uh, done by, uh, uh, by Professor uh, Matthews and, and colleagues here at UH Hilo. And uh, a lot of work in terms of uh, organic amendments, uh, how to increase some organic amendments and how to improve uh, the quality of, of the soil. And uh, uh, 
uh, Mike ha has done a, a lot of work trying to work with local suppliers of, of, of compost and how to create that channel from the farm, uh, from the producer to the, to the farm, to the, to the, to the farm. Uh, I want to emphasize that a different paradigm is the long-term perspective of, uh, of, of organic. Uh, when we do research, it's not a six-month project or a four-month project, but it should be a multi-generational uh, type of project. Uh, I started a, a project back, back in 1993 so that we can come 30 and 40 years and look at the soil once we can actually start to identify the microbes and so on. Uh, it has gone through ups and downs, but uh, I think that every island should probably should, should have a long-term organic, organic project. Uh, we see, the, see this in, in Europe, and uh, some places in Africa, uh, but it's almost like investing on our future generations. Uh, let's do organic research projects uh, that can be institutionalized and keep for future generations. Uh, so far, these systems here are not institutionalized. That means that tomorrow they could go. Uh, so 30 years of work could go down the drain and we can do that start all over again. Uh, so I would just uh, like to leave it at that, that and uh, thank you again, everybody, for, for being here.